testing, omega-1, omega-2. <laughs> Thank you for that very nice introduction. I recently spoke at the University of Pennsylvania, and at the first talk, one of my former students gave a very long introduction, and all I could say afterwards was, thanks for the eulogy. <laughs> I also want to thank Princeton University, and of course you know the Princeton Shield there. There should be underneath a ribbon here that says something rather in Latin, uh, God studied at Princeton, is that what it says? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, my Latin isn't very good. And for years I've been extremely puzzled by what's going on up here, so I consulted Google. Google, you know, is the modern day equivalent of the Delphic Oracle and came up with often much better answers than the Oracle ever did. And so I found, oh no, we're not supposed to say the word Google and Oracle in the same breath anymore. <laughs> But I found out what it means. You see, I was reading it the wrong way. That stands for old, like veteran, and that stands for new, like novel, and it's testament. See, I was reading it the wrong way. And that's very relevant to my talk today because I'm going to speak about the old and the new lambda calculus. And you'll be rather startled at this graphic. It came to me last week from the Princeton uh, Graduate Alumni Association. They're terribly keen on ecology and recycling and all of that. And when I looked at it, I said, oh no, all the dead experts in heraldry are spinning in their graves to see the shield used that way. <laughs> but it's very relevant to the talk today because the lambda calculus has been recycled every decade and is still being recycled as we speak. And so. This is very relevant to the theme. But thanks to Princeton, thanks to the university, thanks to the organizers, especially Bob Sedgwick and Andrew Appel and uh, John Edwards. I exchanged hundreds of emails with him and all the arrangements worked out so extremely nicely. My wife and I are very uh, obliged by how uh, nice it is to be here and everything that was arranged. But I'd also like to say a personal word of thanks to Princeton University. Through the good offices of Norman Steenrod, I was accepted as a graduate student here in 1955. It was an amazing experience. The stellar faculty, the lively graduate students, and all the visitors that came to the university and the Institute for Advanced Study changed my life, changed my career. I'll never have the chance to say it in public again, so I want to say thank you to Princeton for the opportunities that were given me. I also want to say thank you for another opportunity. Uh, about that time uh, during graduate work, Martin Gardner published about the pentominoes. Pentominoes are uh, five, the, all the ways of putting together five squares, and there are 12 different pieces and they fit together amazingly in many different patterns. This is only a mere uh, selection of it. And so through, through, the good, through the good offices of Foreman Acton, who was uh, in the electrical engineering department there, uh, Hale Trotter and I were able to work on the von Neumann machine and uh, program up to find the solutions. Of course, this would be an exercise you give to an undergraduate class now, and so it was found there were 65 solutions, and Solomon uh, Golub uh, wrote a very nice book on pentominoes, which has those. Recently, Don Knuth, who likes algorithms, uh, said, well, look, some of the pieces, some of the pieces are mirror images of each other. Suppose we don't allow you to turn them over, then there are more pieces to go, and surprisingly, they fit together and various patterns there. So he was able to show 46 solutions to that rectangle. There are only basically two solutions uh, to that one. But he couldn't do the 
he couldn't do the 9 by 10 uh, rectangle. And so a chap in Germany adapted his algorithm and found there were more than 10 million. When we were working on the Institute machine, Professor Schwarzschild was very angry at us for wasting time on trivial problems because he was doing computations in cosmology. So I'm relieved that Don Knuth likes to do those puzzles as well. I don't feel so bad about it anymore. <laughs> Let's go to the main topic here. And I say church versus Turing because there was a certain rivalry that took place. That's a picture of uh, Professor Church about the time that uh, maybe a little later uh, when I was a graduate student there. And there's one of the photos of Turing. I would say that's about the time that he came here as a student. And he was lucky to have had a haircut on the ocean liner coming over there to look so tidy to enter as a student here. So what happened was that after Gödel's results, and Gödel was here in Princeton and lectured, and Kleine and Rosser took very elaborate notes on the lectures. And so the idea of undecidability and those questions was well thought about. And then Church realized that the Gödel's methods could be applied to show that there's no decision problem for provability and first order arithmetic. And then there's no decision problem for provability and just pure first order logic. So Turing was solving the same problem in Cambridge, uh, inspired, I guess, by the lectures of Max Newman, whom I met, very engaging uh, professor who had a big influence on uh, many areas of mathematics and computing. And so Turing, typical for Turing, he solved the problem from first principles. He always worked from first principles. And just as he was coming up with the details, they got the note that Church had this uh, proof. Uh, but he was uh, put in contact with Princeton and was invited to become a graduate student here. And his paper appeared uh, when he uh, got here. He was very disappointed that so few, few people asked for reprints. And so we give them independent credit for the uh, solution there, and of course, many other things that uh, took place too. Here are two pictures I got from the family. That's uh, Alonzo Church as a junior at Princeton. Uh, Marianne told me that he was offered a chance to be in the movies. But he was more interested in academics, and so after his uh, postdoc uh, period there. Oh, yes, and he got married in 1926. I think graduate students weren't supposed to be married. But he was involved in an automobile uh, a bicycle accident. Someone ran into him, and he was in the hospital. And Mary was his nurse. And so that's the story behind that. And then after uh, being in Harvard in uh, Europe, uh, he came to Princeton in 29, and you see, he ended in uh, UCLA more than 20 years uh, after that. And so that's a picture of him about the time that Turing met him. Church's early students before the Second World War began with Alfred Foster. He became a professor at Berkeley. I studied with him. I mean, I studied with him. He lectured on Birkhoff and McLean. That was my first algebra course as a sophomore. And then, of course, we all know about Kleine and Rosser uh, that did so much under him and subsequently, of course. And then I discovered that there was another student who was supposed to uh, finish the PhD under Church, but he went back to England uh, before the war was beginning. And then Turing also felt, even though he could have stayed in Princeton after his uh, PhD, he also went back to England and, uh, of course, became involved in all those things that you know about with a connection with the Second World War. And so Church by now has over 3,000 descendants. 
Turing had only one student, my very, very good friend and colleague, Robin Gandhi, uh, whom I, I didn't put all of his uh, appointments down there. His last appointment was uh, at uh, Oxford University. And his study at Cambridge was interrupted by the war, and then that was how he met Turing while working on uh, uh, some cryptography for spoken dialogue. And uh, then Turing came back to uh, Cambridge uh, for a little while, and uh, so Robin wrote his uh, thesis under him, but it was only finished just shortly before Turing's tragic death. Now, the topic here is lambda calculus, and people have been very puzzled by the lambda over the years. If you look in the edition of Turing's thesis that Andrew Appel um, has edited for us, you'll see there is a very wry comment from Stephen, Stephen Claney, who said that his uh, work was appreciated much better when he gave up using the lambda calculus in presentations. John Addison married Marianne as uh, Church's uh, son-in-law, and I asked him once, would you ask Professor Church why he chose the letter lambda? So he wrote a postcard to Church saying, Dear Professor Church, he always spoke to his father-in-law as Professor Church. Dear Professor Church, Russell had the iota operator and Hilbert had the epsilon operator. Why did you choose the letter lambda? There are some apocryphal stories about, about the choice, but Professor Church simply annotated the postcard and sent it back, and in his very neat hand he wrote, Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. <laughs> so it's just another Greek letter. The trouble is, of course, in mathematics, especially linear algebra, we think of it as a multiplier, and so that's confused people there. But it's an abstraction operator. This makes the name of the function of x that takes on whatever values you specify there in a formula uh, involving x. And so, of course, these weren't the names that Church used. These are what Haskell Curry uh, called the uh, rules. The first rule is alphabetic variance. You can always replace a variable by another variable there. Of course, taking care not to capture free variables by other variable binding operators that might occur inside there. But the key thing is beta conversion, and it's called beta because beta is a second letter after alpha. It says, if you name a function and then present it with an argument, it's obligated to give the value you would work out by the formula, whatever it is, by using that argument there, whatever it is. And so you convert from the name of the function and some argument to working out its value there. Curry also liked another rule he called eta conversion for extensionality. I don't like it because in some models it doesn't hold, but this says everything is a function. Anything we can think of can be thought of as naming a function. So what's crazy about this is functions and arguments are of the same type. There's no distinction between what can be a function and what can be an argument. And so if you name a function, you can use it as an argument later on. And in ordinary mathematics, we don't think that way at all. Functions always exist on a higher level than the arguments they have there. A continuous function is not a real number, even though it can take real numbers as arguments. So that's a pretty weird feature of it. And Church was using it for a system of logic because he had additional rules involving logic there. And then his students, Claney and Rosser, showed that that was inconsistent, one of many, many inconsistent theories that have uh, appeared over the years. Uh, and so what Church did was he threw away the logic part and just did the uh, lambda. Lambda calculus is about explicit definitions of functions, and so he wrote his little pamphlet about 
Lambda Calculus there. When I was a student here, he never spoke about Lambda Calculus. I think he was always disappointed that his system of logic failed and became inconsistent. And so after he wrote up that uh, pamphlet, he didn't, he didn't speak about it as far as I know uh, again. Now, does that strange theory where things are of both of the same type have models? It took several years for this to come out, but it has a very easy model using just sets of integers as elements of the model. But we're going to do some coding here, so let's first code up pairs of integers there, so every positive integer can be uniquely factored that way, and so it determines two uh, components of it there. So that's the Girdle numbering for pairs. Not exactly the one that Girdle used, but a, a popular one. Now for sequences, we can start with zero for the empty sequence, and then longer sequences are just iterated pairing. You put the new term on as, at the end, say, uh, to make more pairs. Now, of course, every sequence has several terms here, and sometimes we may want to look at the set of uh, things occurring there. Uh, it's a little hard to tell with this thing here. This is lowercase x, okay? I'm thinking of that as integers. I didn't realize that the fonts would be, look so much the same. This is uppercase x, so I'm thinking of that as a set of integers, okay? And so for uppercase x, for a set of integers, you can form x star, all the numbers representing finite sequences where all the terms of the finite sequence are chosen from capital X there. Okay, are you with me so far? Now here's the punchline. Every set of integers could be thought of as a set of pairs. And we could think of this as a lookup table, n license m as an output. So we say f of x means take all the outputs you can get by forming a finite sequence in x and then looking up to see if you have a license to put it out. A very simple definition. And the inverse of this definition, which defines abstraction, in other words, makes a set that has the right lookup table there, and I throw in the empty sequence there for a purpose I'll tell you in a minute. We just make a lookup table there. We say, whenever we have a finite set, which gives you a value for your formula for the function, you ask, is an integer m an element? Everything is a set of integers in this model, and so you ask whether the integer m is an element of the set that corresponds to the nth finite set, and piece those together. And now, these are inverse to one another, and so these definitions satisfy alpha and beta, those equations for alpha and beta conversion. Also, by throwing in zero here, Every set is contained in this lambda abstraction, lambda x, f of x. This is the largest set which, as a lookup table, has the same operation that f determines. And so that's all there is to the model. And the ingredients of this are extremely elementary. If only I had thought of this in 1957, I would be rich and famous now. But that's not the only thing I missed in my life. But it's really uh, simple. Then I was never able to convince Curry about it. Curry was the most, the, 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 the most formalistic person I ever met. And uh, he really didn't think in terms of, of models. Now here are some things you can do with it. Uh, it's a little bit different from Church's original one. Church didn't like zero because the cancellation uh, operation there uh, he thought might lead to difficulties, and so he forced Claney to count from one. 
in his thesis and it made it uh, a little bit more complicated. But this is essentially what Kleine did in his uh, thesis. Church said, we can identify the integers with, with iterators. So if you iterate a function no times, you're getting the identity function. But if you know how to iterate a function n times, if you just iterate once more, then you're iterating n plus first times. So Church felt that the iterators embodied the essence of the integers there. And he realized that composition of iteration, doing one iteration followed by another, I mean, iterating an iteration there, that's really, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Composing one iteration with another iteration is addition. Composing n on the iteration of f, that's iterated addition, and multiplication is iterated addition. And if you iterate the iterator, you can easily see because of multiplication there, that's iterated multiplication and that's exponentiation. And so Rosser suggested that definition. And so Church gave Kleine the problem of working out arithmetic and uh, more in terms of the calculus of iterators. And it turned out that defining the predecessor was a little bit harder. Kleine had to go to the dentist. And when he was sitting in the dentist chair, he had the inspiration as to how to define predecessor. Kleine didn't use the fixed point uh, combinator, which for every function gives you something that you can think of as the fixed point there, but uh, later people uh, used it to great advantage in connection with recursive functions. Let's see, oh, I'm doing fairly well here. Let me uh, give you a few definitions. Now the key thing about the lambda calculus here is that these definitions you can really think as sort of higher type definitions and so a formula is also a data structure. It's a program, it's a data structure and uh, you can do a lot of different uh, structural things with it. One reason I think why Gödel didn't think that comp computability by computability by lambda calculus was reasonable was this idea of the data structures hadn't been developed very well before Gödel left Princeton. And so uh, Gödel was only here for a fairly short time in the early 30s. And it took a long time to convince him till after Turing's, uh, Turing machines that they had the good definition of computable functions. But to form an ordered pair, you say, give me two components of the ordered pair, and then if I use this lambda abstraction that wraps them up there, I can give you an argument that will cancel one and give you the other back easily. And so this compound thing gives you both the x and the y that you put in there. So you form a pair using the lambda calculus. And now you can take the first element of a pair by giving that cancellation operator and you can take the second component of an ordered pair by giving the other cancellation operator, and so you're set there. Now, the definitions I gave for the church numerals there, we can make into operations, and so this is going from n iterates to n plus one iterates, that's the successor operation. I'm also going to need an operation, this is Claney's insight here, a little bit simplified, about how he defined predecessor. I'm going to use a auxiliary function s which shifts in the following way. You take a pair, I have to wave my hands here. You take a pair, here's the first term and the second term, so what you do is you shift the first term over to the second term of the new pair and then in the first place you apply some operation to the previous first term. So if you iterate this, you're shifting, 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 shifting many times. 
over there. And so Kleene realized that if you start with 0, 0 and apply the shift n plus 1 any number of times, then in the second term you will be just one step behind. And so therefore by taking the second term you have predecessor. Predecessor of 0 is 0 by convention. Predecessor of 1 is 0. Predecessor of 2 is 1 and so forth because the two th terms of the pairs are one step apart. And so that was Kleene's definition. Now you can also use a shift there to test for 0. If you have an integer there, you can say if it's 0, if it's 0, then you've taken the pair here and you can take the first thing that you thought of. U was the first thing I thought of and so if it's 0, you take U, but otherwise you shift things over and the second one will be the second thing you thought of. So that's the test for 0 in a program. And so multiplication can be iterated. That's the multiplication operation we had before. And I just, for sake of example here, uh, there is the definition, recursive definition of the factorial. In the history of human thought, the factorial is the most defined function that has ever been used. Every course defines it. It's a simple recursion there. But now you see the usual way of doing it is you say factorial is defined in terms of the factorial. How can you do that? Well, you can use lambda calculus with a fixed point operator and prove that there is such a term that has this property there. And so, of course, you can go on to other computable functions. So when they finally saw how many things were equivalent, and certainly Kleene needed the help, but Church and Turing worked very hard on it. And of course, in the meantime, uh, Emil Post had defined something similar to Turing computability. So all of those, all of those uh, equivalent definitions of computability of number theoretic functions uh, led to the thesis that that's what computable means, as you, you know the background of that. Now the decision problem, of course, was just the question of whether there's a uh, way to determine computably whether a formula is provable or not. And so uh, for full arithmetic, Church had already seen the provability and full arithmetic wasn't there. But Church's solution for predicate calculus was to say, in order to get to a non-computable function, you only need a finite number of axioms to define it. And so all you have to do is have a number of axioms that allows you to compute a function whose range, say, is non-recursive, as they uh, were able to do. And so therefore, the predicate calculus is, has no recursive decision procedure. Many years later, Raphael Robinson said, we can give a very short axiomatization of some of the properties of the integers there, basically just the basic properties of successor zero and the recursive function, recursive equations for plus and times. And by using quantified formulas, you can see that non-recursive sets can be defined. And so therefore, there's no decision method from this finite number of axioms. So that's a way to make visible the unsolvability of and predicate uh, calculus there. Of course, much later, when we had the uh, Hilbert's tenth problem and the unsolvability of whether polynomial equations are solvable, then you don't have to use quantified formulas to uh, see from this that there can be no decision method because if a polynomial equation had a solution, you'd be able to prove it on the basis of those axioms. Turing's solution, of course, was to take his universal Turing machine and simply formalize the rules of it in predicate calculus. And since he had shown that the universal Turing machine could do anything, uh, he came to the same conclusion there because it only needed a finite number of axioms. Now, if you use very small universal Turing machines, 
you could write down a succinct set of axioms for that if you like. Post and then independently Markov in Russia showed that the word problem for semigroups is undecidable. So the simpler axioms for an associative operation there, uh, the uh, set of equations deducible uh, from those things gives you a, a not recursively solvable problem. So that was the first, so to speak, mathematical, easily understandable to any mathematical person there of an unsolvable problem there. Of course, going back to the early days, Curry introduced his combinators and then discovered that Schoenfinkel had done it uh, earlier. And then he linked up with Church over many years, uh, collaboration there, uh, that uh, combinators were basically equivalent to Church's lambda calculus. So Curry's axioms for the uh, combinators are to use the constant function here, the constant function with value x there, and the Schoenfinkel combinator that sort of shifts things. I call this the killer and the slider because you slide the argument over there at Schoenfinkel's combinator. And so now if we say they are, they are distinct, it's a little bit tiresome to prove, proof theoretically that this is a consistent theory. Curry and later on Church and Rosser did that, but it's a little annoying. But I gave you a model we could have these combinators in the model I gave you. And so that's why that's a consistent theory. And because of what we know about lambda calculus, it has an unsolvable decision problem. Now I'm going to introduce a new notation here to write down an explicit set of axioms. This is the idea of Polish notation. We usually write f of x. Well, that's because it helps to separate the argument there. But for readability, say readability by a machine, you only have to remember the end there. So I'm going to reduce this last parenthesis to a full stop. But I also need to make a nice set of axioms to reverse the order of computation. So I'm going to use the colon to mean the full stop will mean first figure out what f is and then apply it to x. The, the colon here is going to mean first figure out what x is. It may be a complicated formula, so you have to do some massaging to it and then give it to f as an argument there. So it specifies the order of computation. Now, maybe this is too much to read here. But the syntax is quite simple. We could use variables, but I won't make much use of variables here. We have three constants, and I need to add one extra constant over what Curry did there. And then the symbols are the variables, constants, and the punctuation marks there. And so a term is either a variable or a constant, or two terms followed by one of the punctuation marks. Now, certain of the terms have come to an end where there's going to be no more rules how to calculate them. So it's either going to be a constant or a constant followed just by one term or the Schoenfinkel combinator followed by only two terms. There's no more rules for simplifying those, so I say they've come to an end. Now, as it, just as a convenience for formulating rules, a chain is a bunch of terms put together with punctuation marks uh, in between. And so there's a Polish notation that Łukasiewicz invented in Poland there, has very simple readability principles. And so using this very clean syntax, every term can uniquely be decoded, and it's one of the four kinds. And all terms can be looked at as an end of maximal length followed by a chain. And so that readability is very straightforward here. I'll show you readability here. This is my notation. And so each one of these is supposed to be the 
ending parenthesis. So what you do is you give two constants the value 1, and when you come to the next one, you add 1, but when you come to a punctuation mark, you subtract 1, and when you come to a constant, you add 1, and then you add 1, and then you add 1, and then you subtract 1, and subtract 1, and then you add 1, and so on. You see by that algorithm, when you get down to 1 again, that means you have one complete term. But of course, I went from 2 to 2 here, so that's a well-formed subterm. So it's a very simple algorithm. And if you just follow these things by following the numbers, you can do the matching parentheses here to get back to the old notation. And if I use my other punctuation mark here, I hadn't put in twisted parentheses before, but uh, that's what they mean. And then when you untwist the twisted parentheses, you get back to a simple parenthesis uh, combination. My joke here, I see some people are already leaving, so try to get another joke in here. <laughs> by using the combinators which are equivalent to lambda calculus, and by using this convention about order of computation, I have a stored computer program. Not a stored program computer. The expression itself tells you everything you need to know about computing it. So of course, Turing explained computation in very atomic steps here. So what I'm saying is, in terms of this algorithm for parsing, which is just one algorithm, and then in terms of the rules for reducing the combinators, those two things, I mean, one of the things Turing wanted to do was to explain symbolic manipulation. So we just need some very simple rules of symbolic manipulation. We read from left to right, and if we see S followed by three arguments, we slide the third argument over there, leaving out the S, and now we have a new expression here, and so my my chant here is the three R's. Read, rewrite, these are the rewrite rules, and then repeat, go back to the front and do it again. So reading, rewriting, and starting over again, that's, what's, that's the power, that's the handle you're turning to make the computer work. and. Uh, it, it, that that's, does the computations here with them. And we know from the work of uh, combinators and lambda calculus, any expression can be uh, wrapped up as a constant combinator there, and Church and Kleene showed us how to get all the recursive functions, so we're all set there from that work. And now, I gave you an informal explanation of the syntax and the rewrite rules, and all I do is word for word, I swear you, word for word, I write those things down in logic. Okay? And so therefore, on the basis of these things that say I have terms and combinators and reduction rules, these are the one-term reduction rules, in terms of those logical formulae, if you can do a computation intuitively, you can do a computation formally by using predicate calculus. And so, therefore, that's an explicit thing using the Church method there, church turing Claney method for showing solidly. I'm not trying to out-Turing-Turing. -Turing. I thought of this 50 years ago. Uh, of course, it really doesn't change our attitudes toward it, but I liked it because I could write it down explicitly. So that's what happened then, and now I want to talk about uh, what's happening later. So get out of this. So on the sheet, and I had a hard time making up my sheet, and I had to reduce the uh, font size to nine point, I'm sorry, but this is fairly readable here. So 
before World War I, and then there was a big gap at World War I, culminated in Whitehead and Russell there, from Frege to Russell, and of course many people, Dedekind, Piano, many names I can't mention here. It's really sort of crazy to try to make a single timeline because it's really a very branching tree there and I left out a lot of names, but those are some high points before World War I. And now after World War I, Schoenfinkel and Gertigen, though he didn't have a, a very good career and people had to really write his papers for him, he invented the, uh, this idea of combinators. Of course, Hilbert Bernays were working uh, away there as well. And von Neumann, in his thesis, introduced a set theory based entirely on functions rather than sets. And Curry, in Göttingen, developed his combinators and then discovered that Schoen Finkel had done it uh, earlier. And in uh, 1928, Hilbert Ackerman uh, pr uh, published their very good textbook. It's still an okay textbook for logic, I would say. That specifically brings up the decision problem for first order logic. Now, starting with Church after his uh, thesis and his work, and then coming back to uh, Princeton in 29, Curry, de Curry developed much more about combinatory logic, and Church introduced a system with the untyped lambda calculus, and then they got together to understand what was happening there. And in the meantime, Gödel had proved the completeness and incompleteness theory, and also Curry very soon developed ideas of typing in lambda calculus. The original lambda calculus or combinator calculus was given in an untyped way, but you can look at sub-formulas or subsets of formulas and think in terms of types, and so that's a very important idea that Curry introduced already in 34. Hilbert Bernays came out over several years, starting in 1934, and of course we have to remember Gensen because natural deduction and use of lambda calculus with natural deduction has become very important later on. And so Gensen started, Gensen published his things in 35. And then Claney Rosser uh, gave that blow to their thesis advisor that his system was inconsistent, but Church and Rosser proved a very strong confluence theorem and normalization has also become a very important uh, topic. And uh, that showed that uh, in proof theoretic terms that the lambda calculus was consistent. That was Church and Rosser in 36. Turing was coming along with his Turing machines and Post and Church and Turing that we discussed before. And then Claney, what did Claney do? He didn't have much fun with lambda calculus, as he says, but I think if you look at his papers, he simply translated everything that he did in lambda calculus into Gödel numbers for recursive functions and worked entirely in terms of number theoretic functions. So there's a, there's a surreptitious lambda calculus going on there. But the really good development that Church instituted was to define typed logic and typed lambda calculus in a very clear-cut uh, formulation. And so he published his simple theory of types and the typed lambda calculus beginning in 1940. And in 41, he published his pamphlet on the lambda calculus. In the meantime, Gödel was thinking, though he didn't publish for a long time, about higher type primitive recursive functions. He lectured on that, I think, in 41. And Claney was barreling on in recursive function theory with his Claney's hierarchy. And then World War II hit, which again made a big break in everyone's uh, research. And after the war, a new, a new uh, beast rears its ugly head, category theory. So Eilenberg and McLean published their paper in 45. In the meantime, Henkin worked on models. Church had given Henkin the uh, 
plan to prove the independence of the axiom of choice, but what Hankin did was, as he wrote uh, in a paper in the Bulletin of uh, Symbolic Logic, he found his models for type theory and uh, a different approach to giving the models for first-order logic for Gödel's completeness theorem. Turing, as we know, was thinking in terms of artificial intelligence. And I have to thank Paul Rosenblum. I never met him, alas. But in his little logic book, that's where I learned about combinators. And I remember vividly the first day that I read about combinators, I had nightmares all night. <laughs> Von Neumann had started, and the computing machine came. It was soon taken over by IBM and Claney. Uh, was working further on recursive function theory. Now I have to skip a little along here a little bit. There's lots of development in programming languages once there was a computer of reasonable power to program. And so very important uh, was Algol 58. It was originally just a language for publication, but it became uh, a language for implementation as well. Now John McCarthy, the late John McCarthy, claimed that he wasn't influenced by Church with the lambda calculus in his formulation of Lisp, but it's kind of hard for me to believe that. But anyway, uh, Lisp became very, uh, as you know, very important. And in category theory, I remember Dan Kahn uh, and his paper on adjoint functors. That's very important. Claney continued for higher type computability. Claney and Kreisel had higher type functionals which are very much connected with other things that took place later. Dijkstra claims to have been the first professional programmer, and he introduced ideas about recursive procedures and programming languages. Algol 60, with a big committee, was a big improvement over that. But in category, but in category theory, Grotendieck appeared on the screen, scene, and it took some time to understand what he was about with the notion of topoi. Topoi turns out to be models for higher type logic, but using intuitionistic logic rather than classical logic. Of course, classical logic is a sub-system of that if you make the right assumptions, and so it includes models for classical logic, but from uh, algebraic geometry, Topoi came. And it took some time for Lavier and others and I have to uh, skip ahead here, but lots of uh, results from category theory began to make clear the relation to logic. Also, there's a very interesting thing that in programming, using things that can be easily expressed in lambda calculus, Van Weingarten in uh, Holland introduced continuations, and that idea of continuations was discovered independently six or seven times after that. So, Eilenberg was very influential. Uh, uh, Peter Landon had new ideas about programming, pro programming languages. Richard Platek had a very important thesis from Stanford with higher order recursion theory, but again, he was thinking more of Claney's infinitistic uh, recursion theory. De Brown developed Automath, and that started a trend to bring together constructive logic and lambda calculus in very good ways. Algol 68 by Van Weingarten, uh, I'm so glad I was never on the Algol committees because they fought tooth and nail, and Van, Van Weingarten finally triumphed there. It's a very interesting language, but it turned out not to be used as much as, as hoped. And so there's more things. Then in 69, I thought of things that led to the models for the lambda calculus, and so you have that. Let's not forget Bill Howard, who related interpreting formulas with lambda expressions and formulas as types. That's very important. I had some ideas along that line, which I didn't develop because Gödel discouraged me so much there, which is too bad. And in the meantime, continuations were rediscovered several times. And categorical logic came, and Lovier and Tierney explained the elementary theory of topoi, which made it possible to understand things. So, you see, Martin Lerf came on the scene. The connections between computing, logic, proof theory all came together, 
and lambda calculus is essential for formulating things and doing that. And then uh, Milner developed the logic for computable functions, and ML was the uh, programming language for that, and it began to have a life of its own. And much more, I ha I'm sorry I have to skip along here, very important development in category theory was locally Cartesian closed categories, which really related to Martin Lerf's uh, type theory. So all of those things came together, and there are many developments for design of programming languages. And a very important one that's extremely important today is Haskell, of which uh, Phil Wadler was essential in bringing it. We're going to hear from him. And so all of those things made not only the concepts important, but also the implementations in various languages. But now the new thing that's going to happen, and this is my last comment here, is after all those developments with category theory, there's a lot of thinking about other categories. You see, the category theorists were able to, were able to find many more models than the logicians ever did. And so Professor Vodovsky over there at the Institute is thinking about using homotopy theory for some new models for logic. He has many grand ideas that's going to be intensively studied in the next academic year over at the Institute. So I end here with this comment from my colleague Bob Harper. You see, he says, it was very important with lambda calculus, and it's been used in so many ways, recycled, as I said there, even though Turing gives a psychologically motivated idea of computability, things formulated similar to lambda calculus have had more significance. And uh, he's a little harsh in saying nobody cares about, the cares about the details of the Turing machine. Never mind, he's rather outspoken. But he says, lambda conquers all. So would that be a new motto for Princeton? OK, maybe not. But let's say, thank you, Princeton. Thank you, Church. Thank you, Turing. And thank you for coming to my lecture today. <laughs>